Okay. Um, if you haven't already, please um, be sure to mute yourselves um, just so we don't get the background noise. Um, if you're, I can also do it from my end too if you can't figure it out. Um, if you have any questions as I'm going along, feel free to put them in the chat. The chat function can be located um, down below. Um, I should just have a little chat box. Um, feel free to pop your questions in there or we can also take them at the end to go over those as well. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. I'm going to start. Okay. Okay, so there's my contact information. Um, as I said, I am the director of, at NU. Um, but what I'm going over today is just general financial aid, not specific to Niagara. Um, I'm, of course, be happy to answer any questions about Niagara, but this is really just a general financial aid um, that would be ap applicable to any college or university that your son or daughter might be applying to. There's our main number, and then my email address if you wanted to shoot me an email later on if you had any follow-up questions. All right, so for financial aid, the first thing that you really need to do is to complete your FAFSA form. Um, the FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Assistance, and it's really the driving factor in any type of financial aid that your student might get, above and beyond any potential merit scholarships, and we'll get to those in a little bit. Um, but really, if you're looking for financial aid, you need to complete the FAFSA form. The first step in this is um, that both the student and a parent, just one, not both, um, needs to apply for an FSA ID. You need to um, get one. It doesn't take very long to do. Um, please be sure to use separate email addresses. So you can't use the same email address for both the parent and the student while you're doing this. Um, you need to make sure that you do have separate ones, otherwise it's going to make things very messy. Um, again, the student needs their own and then at least one of the parents. We do recommend that both parents do get an FSA ID at some point, um, particularly for when you're potentially applying for any parent federal loans. We'll touch on those a little bit down the road, but um, it doesn't hurt for both parents to get an FSA ID. And you can, um, the website is just fsaid.ed.gov is where you would go to apply for those. And you can do those at any time. Um, also, um, the next thing that we're gonna mention, and I did want to mention that we, I did send these documents, um, a copy of this over to um, Pam who posted it on the website um, under I believe counseling under resources and also a copy of our it's not well it's purple for me but not for you um, that you're seeing it um, is the financial aid for college overview so this does contain all the websites we're going to talk about um, so you should be able to, to view those um, I'll also include the links um, in the chat as well, um, so you can have easy access for that. Actually, let me do that at the end so you can have those. Um, okay, so FAFSA on the web worksheet, again, it is posted for 21-22. Right now, this is just kind of like the draft version that they have out there. Um, but I do recommend following this, um, kind of reviewing it. We're gonna go through it um, piece by piece today, um, just so that you kind of jot things down so you have them ready to go when you do complete the FAFSA form. Okay, um, so this is what it looks like. The, the very beginning kind of tells you the sites to go to, FAFSA.gov. Okay, this is the student's FAFSA. So it is in the student's name, even though you will need, most likely need uh, parental information to be put on there as well. It is the student's information. So you need to make sure that when you're starting the FAFSA, you're, you're doing it as the student. And hopefully you're, you're working on it together. Um, you're going to need just the basic student information, first name, last name, social security number. Please be careful with this. We have parents who unfortunately mix up their students, you know, siblings, social security numbers, and then it just creates a mess and a headache for everyone. So make sure you're using the correct social security number. Uh, in order to file the FAFSA, you do have to be a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen, like a permanent resident. Um, if you are not uh, either a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen, then you would not be able to file the FAFSA. Um, and you would just be um, typically applying for maybe any state aid or uh, institutional aid that the schools might have and not federal. Um, you do have to put down if the student is single, typically the yes at this point, married, separated, divorced. Again, for high school students, it's typically single. 
Um, then it will move on to the selective service registration. This is only for males. Um, if you are a male student, 18 or, or older, you do have to sign up for the selective service in order to be eligible for any federal aid. I know it's kind of an outdated rule. We haven't had the draft in a very long time and there is talk about potentially eliminating this question, but for the time being, it still exists and you still have to go ahead and apply. Um, and male students have to um, sign up for the selective service or else they will not be able to receive any federal aid. It's gonna ask um, some questions about the highest school that parent one or parent two completed. Please note that it won't say mother, father. It does say parent one or parent two. Um, so just make sure that you're kind of keeping all those straight as you go along um, when you're filling out the rest of the information. It's also then going to ask some questions about the student dependency status. Um, just a reminder to mute yourselves um, as we go along, just so we don't have any of that feedback. Thank you. Um, so for the student status, um, it's going to ask if they were born before January 1st, 1998, um, if they were married, if they're in the armed forces, if they're a veteran, if they're um, in foster care, if they're in legal guardianship, emancipated. So there's a lot of questions that they ask. The point um, why they're doing this is to see if the student would actually be eligible to be considered an independent student, meaning that they don't have to provide parental information. Now, typically, you know, 95% of the students coming from high school would be considered a dependent student, which means that they would have to put down parent information on the FAFSA. Um, but if they happen to fall into one of these other ones, then they would check that and they would only put their information down. Please note though that most schools will probably ask for some additional follow-up information, typically court documentation, depending upon which one, um, which of the buckets the student might fall under. Okay, so keeping with the student session, maybe if I can, there we go. Um, so if the student is dependent, um, then we'll start asking for parent information. Um, and a question I get asked quite often is, okay, well, which parent do I report? We're either divorced, um, not living together. So if the parent, if your parents are married or unmarried, but you're living together, then you would report both parents' incomes on the FAFSA. If in the case of divorce, um, you would report whoever the student lives with more than 50% of the year at the time with during the prior 12 months. And I know someone, I always get this question, well, tech, it's 50-50. You know, well, there's 365 days in the year, so it technically cannot be 50-50. But if it is, um, if that's what you determine, then you would go off of whoever provides the most parental financial support. Um, so typically it, it usually goes along with maybe whoever makes the most money, um, but that would be the parent to report if you are divorced. So first thing is if whoever the student lived with more than 50% of the time in the prior 12 months, and if for some reason it ends up being 50-50, then you would go with whoever provided the most financial support to the student during those 12 months. It will then go into asking parent information. Um, you would have to report, uh, again, parent one, parent two, keep that in mind. Um, another thing to keep in mind is if your parents, your biological parents are divorced, um, and let's say your mother has remarried, um, you have to include stepdad's information. Even if stepdad is not helping out um, at all with college expenses, they are considered part of that family and they do need to have their income and information reported on the FAFSA. So please keep that in mind um, as you go along. I do get that question a lot as well, but if you are you know, divorced and remarried, you do have to report both the parent and the step parent's information on the FAFSA. It's also then going to start asking about tax information and if they file tax, if your parents file taxes, um, you would you know, check off whichever one that is. At this point, and we'll get into it a little bit um, part in the next slide, is the data retrieval form. So it's going to ask you, okay, you filed your taxes, great. Would you like to transfer that information directly from the IRS and put it into your FAFSA? I highly recommend doing this. Um, it definitely cuts down on the amount of information that the schools have to ask for and it kind of makes the process go a little bit more smoothly. Um, I assume everyone here is a, a current senior, so you would be applying for the 21-22 FAFSA, meaning that you're using 2019 tax information. Hopefully by now everyone has their 2019 taxes done. I know there was kind of that a little bit of an extension, but hopefully everyone has that done um, and can use the data retrieval system. But please note that the tax information for the 21-22 FAFSA is based off the 2019 tax year. 
it's then going to also, once the uh, information transfers from the IRS data retrieval tool, it will then ask for the individual wages. So the information that transfers from the data retrieval tool is like the AGI, the taxes paid, um, education credits. So there's a couple of different things that happen with that. Well, each wages for parent one and parent two need to be input manually. So you will have to have your W-2s with you as you're completing the FAFSA form, again, from 2019. It's also then going to ask if any of the parents received um, Medicaid, SSI, SNAP benefits, or food stamps, free or reduced lunch, um, WIC, one, any one of those things, and you would just check that box. Um, it's also going to ask, and there's a lot of skip logic involved when you're doing the FAFSA because it's all online. This is just the, the worksheet to kind of get you prepared for it. When you do it online, there's a lot of skip logic involved. So you might not have to answer every single one of these questions, um, but keep in mind that these are things that you potentially will have to at the, um, complete. It'll ask you if you paid any child support, um, if you um, put any money towards your 401k during the year, not the amount of the 401k, but any money contributed to you know, to it during the 2019 year. Um, if you received any child support, um, tax exempt interest income. So there's a lot of um, different things that they will ask you. And they do give pretty detailed instructions on where to find that information on your, either your W-2s or your taxes. So there is, again, there's a lot of skip logic. There's also a lot of help and assistance um, as you go along. Now, depending upon all that information you put in, um, you also will be asked how many people are in the household um mom dad you know parent one parent two any siblings um it's also going to ask how many are in college so the sibling themselves uh or the student themselves and then many potential siblings keep in mind parents that if you are in college you unfortunately cannot count yourself as being in college um, on the fafsa form for the students fafsa so if you're filling out your student's FAFSA and you're in college as the parent, you can't include yourself. But if you have any other siblings, the student does, they would be included. Now, based upon all that information, the number in household, the number in college, the amount of income, uh, it might ask you for to report asset information. Again, that there's that skip logic involved, so you might not have to. But if you are, um, you would have to report that as well, including potentially any businesses or investment firms. The asset questions, this differs a little bit. So um, the tax information was based upon 2019, but the asset questions are going to be based upon 20 or the current year that you're filling them out. So whenever you fill it out, as of that date, what are their assets? So your cash, your savings, your checking accounts, net worth of other investments, again, not your 401k or retirement plans, um, but it would be like other types of stocks and bonds. And then if you have a business or, or an investment farm as well, um, you would put those that information. Again, you might not have to based upon the skip logic, but be prepared to have this ready to go just in case. All right, so after you fill out that information, it's then going to go back to the student information. And it's going to ask all the same questions um, for the student income as um, the parents were asked, but now this is based upon the student. A lot of times students in high school, especially since it's based upon, you know, pretty much prior, prior year information, might not have worked, they might not have income, that's totally fine, just fill that out, you know, say did not file or did not work, um, and you should be good to go. But if the students did work, did have um, an income and did file taxes, you're going to have to report that. Again, you can also use the data retrieval tool um, on the student tax information as well, as long as they have uh, the file tax reform um, with the IRS, then they'll be good to go. Um, again, it'll ask them how much they worked, how much they earned. Uh, also, it'll ask for spouse, but that's only if you know they're married, of course. And again, they're going to ask those same questions: had Medicaid, SSI, SNAP. Um, typically, the students don't have these things, more so on the parent side, but it does ask it. And again, typically, I don't really see a lot of you know students coming out of high school with a lot of these things. You no, know, no child support. Uh, they don't have haven't contributed anything towards their pensions. They don't have them yet. Um, but again, once in a while, something might pop up that they would have to report. And again, they might be asked about their assets as well. So in order to actually fill out the FAFSA, so by this point, you should have your FSA ID set. You kind of have everything gathered. Um, the website you're going to go to, you can either go directly to the FAFSA.gov website or everything's really housed under, under the studentaid.ed.gov website. Um, and all that will be at the end of this presentation as well as in the booklet that um, I'm gonna pop 
pop into the chat. Um, but best.gov, studentaid.gov, it'll take you to the same place. You're going to go apply for college, apply, um, apply for aid. Um, if you've never been to the site before, um, never filled out a FAFSA form before, you would just go to new to FAFSA, of course. Um, or you would go to uh, a returning user if you need to make a correction, or maybe you've you know, filled one out in a prior year for some reason, um, you would go to. Once there, um, you are either going to log in saying that you know, the student is doing it, or you're gonna say, oh, I'm actually the parent filling it out. And the only difference with this is just how they present their questions to you. So again, be careful of which one you choose, you know, the, you, know you actually have to fill out everything. All right, we talked about the data retrieval tool. Um, so it's available to start using October 1st, which um, crazily enough is only in a couple of days uh, next week. Um, this coincides with, of course, the opening of the FAFSA form for the 21-22 year. So you cannot complete the FAFSA form yet for next year. October 1st is when it opens. You don't have to do it on the very first day. Um, the, typically, the website typically gets a lot of volume that day. So you might wanna wait, give it a couple of days, kind of let, let everyone else kind of go on there and then start completing it. Um, we do recommend that you use the data retrieval tool when completing the FAFSA. Again, this just makes sure that the information that gets reported on the FAFSA is correct and accurate. Um, and it really reduces the amount of information that the schools might ask for as follow-up. About 30% of our students get selected for verification by the federal government every single year. And that means that we have to then verify the information that's on the, on the FAFSA, which means we have to ask you, the parents and students, to fill out additional information or provide additional documentation. Um, doing the data retrieval tool definitely cuts that um, process down a lot. So again, highly recommend you do the data retrieval tool. So when you're completing the FAFSA, um, again, you're gonna put all that information in. I say give it maybe 45 minutes to an hour the first time um, that you're doing it, just because you wanna make sure you're filling it out correctly, you have all the information gathered with you. Um, after that, after the following years, it gets a lot easier. Um, but the first time, give it about 45 minutes or so. Make sure you have, have all that information with you. Um, you can also list up to 10 schools on the FAFSA. Um, when you are filling it out, it's going to ask you, okay, what school do you want to send this information to? You can list up two. You can list up to 10. Um, you also have to tell them whether you're going to be living on campus or at home or in an off-campus apartment. Um, that's going to be one of the fields you're going to have to fill in. Um, please know, because it only lets you, do, lets you do 10 at a time. If you um, have more or are applying to more than 10 schools, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to fill out, fill out for those 10 schools, give it about a week to process, go back into the FAFSA, take some schools off, and put some more back on that you haven't put on there yet. This kind of can get a little tricky, so I really recommend writing everything down, making sure that you know which schools are on there at a time and which are not. Because if you end up going to a school that's got taken off your FAFSA, that's not really good because corrections won't be able to be made um, and we won't get any updated information. So please, if you're at, if you are applying to more than 10 schools, please make sure you're keeping track of this as you go along. But once you submit the FAFSA, again, all this is done electronically, you will actually receive an email acknowledgement for it. Um, this is kind of a, a version of the paper copy. Um, it's called the Student Aid Acknowledgement Report or the SAR Acknowledgement. Um, it will tell you, kind of just give you an, an overview of everything you put in, all the information you put in. It's gonna say, is this correct? If something's wrong, you can go back and fix it, um, but it will give you all that information. It's also going to give you some information. Um, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not. Um, it, the data release number, the DRN number, it's usually a four digit number. That's um, kind of like a pin number. What it does is it allows, um, if let's say you didn't add a school on there and now you're interested in um, attending a different school, that school can actually add themselves onto the FAFSA, but they'll need the DRN number. So kind of important to keep that in mind. And well, this report will also tell you my contribution or ESC. In this instance, it's zero. Um, and it also has a C code. So if you have a C code, it means something's wrong um, or something couldn't you know, there's a conflict somewhere. So the school will usually follow up with you for additional documentation to resolve something. That's a, a good thing to keep in mind. Um, these two numbers, the DRN and the EFC, are two numbers that you're gonna want to know um, so that you are aware of, of how you're being um, federally awarded. Ten schools on the FAFSA. Each school will receive the FAFSA electronically within three to five business days. 
Um, sometimes they go pretty quickly. I've seen them come in in a couple of days and other times it seems to take a little bit. So three to five business days is when the school will receive the FAFSA. Um, and once they receive the FAFSA, if there's something wrong with it, like I said, there's a C code or something, they'll reach out to you to ask for you to either update that on the FAFSA or provide some type of documentation to the school themselves so they can move forward with your packaging. Please be sure to kind of pay attention for emails or phone calls coming from uh, the financial aid offices at the different schools, um, especially this early on as, you know, it's, it means we're trying to follow up with some additional information. Um, you might also see a range. Um, so once we have your FAFSA, a valid one, and we put together uh, your package, we will send out an award letter. Now, some award letters might be paper, um, kind of sent out in the, in the mail, and other ones will be like, just electronic notification, go here to your portal to review everything. You might see a range of when these award letters come out. Some schools might start sending them out in November, December, and others might, honestly, might not until like March or April. Here at Niagara, we send our, ours out in January, right after Christmas break. Um, but again, you're gonna see that, that wide variety of um, when you get those financial aid packages. So um, I'm actually going to just pause for a second just before I kind of get into the cost of attendance. Does anybody have any questions on the FAFSA um, and any components of that that they um, were maybe a little fuzzy on? I have an older son. Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Um, he went to school in Syracuse. He's 26, so he already graduated. Mm -hmm. um, I already have a FAFSA number. I have to use the same one for my daughter, right? Yeah. So if you are, if you have um, the FSA user ID for yourself already, then yes, you would have to use the same one for yourself. Your daughter would need to create one for her own. So I just change the information because it's going to automatically pop up with Joe's information. No, so the FSA ID is actually attached to you. Um, okay. So that's just like your sign your electronic signature for it. So when you go to do the FAFSA for your daughter, it would be all her information, but you're going to use your FSA user ID to sign off on it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let me see if I can get the chat. Let me see. Okay, so one question was, if you fill out the FAFSA in early October and list potential schools, but don't fill out college applications until later, will the school still be able to find the FAFSA? Well, that's a great question. So yes, um, even if you haven't applied to a school yet, please still, um, and you're, you're interested in them, please still list them on the FAFSA. The school will get it. And as soon as you're an accepted student there, they will link everything up and be able to send you that package. So just because you're not accepted there yet or haven't applied yet, um, through their admissions office doesn't mean that you should leave them off your FAFSA. Please go ahead and still complete the FAFSA for that. Um, again, they will link up at, at, at the point of acceptance. We cannot put together financial aid packages for students who are not accepted at our school. Um, so there is that delay sometimes between, you know, you did the FAFSA, the school has the FAFSA, but you're not accepted yet. But that's perfectly normal, not a problem. And another question was, as far as the EFC, will indicate an amount we have to pay the school. Great question. I usually mention this and I did not. Um, so just because the EFC says zero, um, for instance, does not necessarily mean that that's all that you want to pay anything. Uh, the EFC, the estimated family contribution, is just a standard number um, that's produced within the federal formula that allows um, all schools to be packaging upon the same information. Um, so it might depend upon what school you're going to. Perhaps if you have a zero EFC and you're going to a state school or a community college, you might not have to pay anything. You might have, you know, Pell Grants or TAP Grants if you go to New York State, and you might not have to pay anything. But if you're going to a private school, typically you would still have, have a remaining balance. Same thing even if the EFC was like 10,000, let's say, um, that does not necessarily mean that you would only owe $10,000. It's really just a standard way for schools to be able to put together financial aid packages for students, and it does not necessarily correlate with what the student or, or family will end up owing. I think there was one more question that came through. Sorry, let me just see if I can find it. Nope, that's not it. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, and then the other question, if I have twins that will be starting college at the same time, do I list them as siblings attending college on each other's FAFSA? Yes. Um, so if you have 
twins or two siblings at, at the same time, yes, on each, you have to do a FAFSA for each of them. Each of them will have their own FAFSA, uh, but you would, when it says how many will be in college, you put two or more if you have other students in college as well. Um, and then someone else says, I missed the info on listing parents on FAFSA. I'm the legal custodial guardian of a child that is not my biological child. Do we still need to add her dad? So if you are, so that gets into a little bit of a different scenario. Um, so if the student is in a legal guardianship since the age of 13, they would technically be considered, and granted, you have to have court paperwork for this. They would legally, they'd be considered an independent student and they'd only report their own student information. Um, the schools that you're applying to might ask for, to see that documentation. Um, so, you know, it should have to be um, something from the courts, attorneys, anything like that would be helpful um, for the schools to be able to kind of proceed with that. If um, you don't have, sometimes so custody is different than guardianship um, in New York State. So if you have custody and not guardianship, um, they might not be able to put it through as an independent student right away, but they might be able to do an override. Um, and in those cases, you might have to provide some additional statements or something from you know people that are know of the situation, school counselors, those types of things. So hopefully that answered it. Um, feel free to kind of keep on posting questions as we go along. Um, and okay, let me move this over and we will continue on. Okay. So I want to kind of go over the different things that you're going to hear about when you're applying to colleges. You're going to hear these phrases a lot. I just wanted to go over what these different things mean. So let's start with the cost of attendance or the COA. Side note, we use lots and lots of acronyms in financial aid. Um, sometimes you don't realize it as we're talking to people and you're like, what's going on? Please feel free to stop us if you don't understand what we're saying, but we do use lots of acronyms just because there's so many different things. But the COA is the cost of attendance. This includes direct cost, um, direct cost, which, which would be like tuition, fees, if you're living on campus, room and board, books potentially, anything that's charged directly to the student on their student account. And it also includes indirect cost. This would be um, room and board if you're not living on campus, if you're a commuter, transportation, personal costs, um, books and supplies if they're not charged directly to the, to the student. The things that we know students will have expenses for, but they're not charged directly to the student. So those two things combine to um, have their, what we call the cost of attendance. Now this can vary widely from college to college um, because again, uh, some you know tuition rates are different, board rates are different. So a community school versus a private school, you might have a, a vastly different um, cost of attendance. By federal regulation, the schools are not allowed to award aid above and beyond the cost of attendance. So let's say your cost of attendance is $45,000, you know, tuition fees, room board, transportation, personal costs, all that good stuff. Um, and let's say you took, you know, you have your financial aid, then you take, you know, for $30,000 and you took out a loan for another $20,000. We can't certify that full $20,000. We can only go up to your cost of attendance. Um, I, we get a lot of questions on this. It is um, a federal regulation. We cannot give you more money above and beyond what your cost of attendance is. So kind of keep it in mind, and that's more so for when you start college um, or what goes into consideration. Okay, so you have your cost of attendance, which is the basic budget. You then have your expected family contribution or the EFC, which we talked about prior to this. Um, this is the amount, so that kind of ties in that question from earlier, so thank you. Um, it does correlate to the amount a family can reasonably be expected to contribute, but it does not mean that um, that's what you will be paying exactly. It does stay the same regardless of college or whatever school you're applying to, whether it's a state school, a private school, Harvard, whatever, it stays the same. Um, two components, a parent section and a student section based upon those income asset um, questions. Um, then it is calculated using that federal um, process with the FAFSA form. So this takes us to financial need. So what is financial aid? You're gonna hear that a lot. Oh, this is a need-based award, a need-based grant. Okay, well, what does that mean? So we determine in financial aid offices, financial need by this formula. We take your cost of attendance, and then we minus away your expected family contribution, and that remaining number is your financial need. And that means you can have need-based aid, um, typically with the, the different awards in a little bit, but that's like Pell Grants, Opportunity Grants, Work Study, Subsidized Loans, maybe institutional money, all those things are based upon need. 
So you have to have financial need based off of this calculation in order to have that aid awarded to you. And again, every student can be different because every student's situation and their FAFSA is different. Um, so now that we kind of went over the need, some of the different types of financial aid you'll see in um, a financial aid package are kind of broken down into these four groups. So you have your scholarships, your grants, um, you know, those are merit scholarships, um, your grants, Pell grants, opportunity grants, need-based grants from the institution. Both of those things, free money. You want those, of course. Um, don't have to pay that back, um, which are, of course, is always something everyone would like. Uh, the next one are, we call self-help. Uh, so that would be loans. So the, whether they're federal loans or private loans, either in the student's name or in the parent's name, they're loans. You do have to pay those back after graduation. And then the next one would be employment, whether it's like a work study job or maybe some type of student employment on campus. So the student would be awarded um, an amount and they would have to you know, work um, that award in order to be able to, to receive the money to potentially put onto their account or use for spending money, whatever they would like. But so top two, free money. The last two, you either have to pay it back or you have to work for it. Um, kind of going along with the sources of financial aid, the largest source of financial aid is the federal government. And this is based upon that, the FAFSA form that we talked about. Um, it is going to include the largest amounts of funds, amounts of grants, amounts of loans, all those come directly from the federal government. Then you have states. Um, so if you are a New York State resident um, and you're attending a New York State school, you potentially might be eligible for some state aid, whether it's based off of your finances or potentially there's some merit scholarships out there through New York State as well. Um, that students could apply for. Um, there is an application for the state that you have to fill out as well. It is separate from the FAFSA. When you complete the FAFSA form at the very end, the very last page after you hit submit, it's going to say, would you like to transfer your tax information over to New York State, your state application? Please say yes. I highly recommend this. I know you might be kind of like, okay, I just spent all this time on the FAFSA. I don't really want to go ahead and, and do another application, but it will save time because it will automatically transfer over that information you just put into the VASPA into your state application. If you don't do it at that time, totally fine, um, but you will have to wait about a week for the FAFSA to process. It will kind of send information over behind the scenes, but you will still have to go into the state, um, hask.ny.gov, we'll get to that website, um, and still apply separately. So you kind of have to fill everything out a second time. So if you are able to, please fill it out right after you complete the FAFSA so it can link up, but if not, you can still go ahead and complete it after. So yeah, states, private sources. Now this could be anything from, pretty much that means it's anything not from the federal, the state, or the institution. It could be Community Foundation, a Greater Buffalo Grants, American Legion, Wegmans has scholarships, um, anything that's coming from a source not, you know, from the school, the state, or the feds. Um, civic organizations and churches, like I said, Community Foundation Greater Buffalo was one I really always recommend to everyone in our area. Um, and employers, I know Wegmans has stuff, um, so whether it, you know, a student or maybe a parent is working there, um, sometimes parent, uh, employers have agreements with different schools that they might get a reduction or a discount um, or a scholarship, so it doesn't hurt to ask um, as you're going through the application process. As I said, the federal government, largest source of financial aid, it is um, the aid is awarded primarily on the basis of financial need. Um, regardless, every student would be eligible for at least $5,500 in an unsubsidized loan, um, potentially, even if you have no need. Um, but most of the other stuff is based upon having that financial need that we talked about. You do have to apply every single year um, in order to be reconsidered for the federal aid um, using the FAFSA form. The nice thing is that um, after you complete the first year of your FAFSA, it's really just a renewal process moving forward. So you just have to, all the basic information you filled out the first year is still there. You just have to update like the tax year um, and some of the you know, other information, whether your number in household changed or number in college, but it does go a little bit faster the following years. Some common federal aid programs, uh, the Pell Grant, this is based off, there's no specific income amount for this, but it does go off of the EFC, the um, Expected Family Contribution Number. So for this year, I believe it's about, if your EFC is about less than 52,000 or 5,200, 50, sorry, 5,200, um, you would be eligible for a Pell Grant. Currently that ranges up to um, anywhere as low as a couple hundred dollars, all the way up to about $6,300 for the year. There's the TEACH Grant, which is for students who are going into education. 
Um, this is something you want to check with the individual colleges that you're applying to if you are interested in this. One note um, of kind of a heads up is that this particular grant, it is a grant, but if you don't meet all of the qualifications as you um, after you graduate, it does turn back into an unsubsidized loan. So just something to be um, aware of as you're um, looking into it. The opportunity grant, um, schools don't have a ton of the opportunity grants available. Each school is kind of limited in what, what we're allowed to give out. So um, whereas the Pell Grant, if you're eligible for it, you get it regardless of anything else. The opportunity grant, each school has kind of a limited pool of that. So you might not see it in your financial aid package, but it might show up, um, just depends on the school. Federal work study, you do have to have financial need in order to be work study eligible. This is where a student would work 10 to 12 hours a week on campus typically. Um, at least that's how we do it at, at Niagara. Um, they can either put some of the money towards their balance or they could take the uh, you know paycheck every two weeks um, and use it for whatever expenses that they would like. Um, keep in mind, although you might be financially eligible, you might have the financial need aspect for a work study program. Some schools, most schools have very limited number of jobs. We only have about 100 new jobs, actually probably less than that now um, at Niagara. Um, each year to award. So unfortunately, it is something that not everyone would be able to get in their package, but you might be able to go on a waiting list as well. Um, subsidized and unsubsidized loans. So these are federal loans in the student's name. Um, for freshman students coming in, the most they would be eligible for is $5,500 for the year. Now, the split of that depends upon their financial need. If you have financial need, you can have a maximum of $3,500 subsidized and then the $2,000 unsub. Again, the $5,500 total for freshman year. Uh, subsidized is when the government pays the interest on the loan while the student is in school. Unsubsidized, they don't pay the interest, although right now the interest is really low with everything going on, unfortunately. It's only, um, most I've seen is only around 2% right now. So it's a um, not bad, not, not a bad loan right now. Um, but the unsubsidized, the government does not pay the interest on that loan while the student is in school. So it is accruing. And then plus loans, these are actually, they're federal loans, but they are in the parent's name. So this is something parents can take out um, above and beyond. You know, if they're just still trying to get a balance paid off, they can apply for this loan using your FSA ID that you created for the FAFSA. You would um, apply for this. Only one parent has to do it. If you get approved for the loan, then you know we would be able to process that through. Um, if you are denied for the loan, the student would automatically get an additional four thousand dollar unsubsidized loan for the year for as a freshman. So something to consider um, as you kind of look into your options for paying the balance. Uh, states, um, I talked about before for New York State, um, if you're a New York State resident going outside of New York State for a for school, you are not eligible to, to receive that aid, that you have to be attending a school within New York State in order to be eligible for that award. So if you are going out of state, unfortunately, you can't take that with you. Um, most of the money awarded through the state is based upon financial need. There is an income cutoff for the TAP award, the tuition assistance program, a combined family income, so student and parents income for New York State net taxable has to be less than 80,000. So if you are above 80,000 for your net taxable income for New York State, you would not be eligible for the state for the TAP award. Um, but if you are below that, then you would see a potentially a range of um, either from 500 to up to 5,100 for the year in the TAP grant. There's also the um, Excelsior program, the enhanced and the ETA, the enhanced tuition award. Excelsior is for um, if a student is potentially attending a state or community college. Um, those right now, the income for that cutoff is $125,000, and that would cover your tuition minus any Pell or TAP. Um, there's a lot of things attached to that. There's a lot of criteria. Um, so please, if you're looking into that, please look at all of the um, uh, criteria. Um, in order to continue on because it can get kind of strict and um, once you're off of that you're you're off of it it's hard to get back on you can't get back on if you don't meet the qualifications um, and the mandates for that um, it does use the information from the fafsa as i said please make sure you try to transfer that if you can if not you can go back but it does take a little bit longer um, and deadlines vary by state um, here in new york state um, it, you know as long as um, the semester's not over you can still apply for it but again we do recommend you kind of have that uh, um, well before you start school. Um, okay, private sources, we kind of talked about this earlier, so I won't really go into that. Um, but I will say, please, for parents, if your students are in the call, please have them start doing this. 
sooner rather than later, at least looking into it, you know, over the fall and the winter, looking to see what, what might be available out there for local community scholarships. Um, there's a ton of, um, you know, Western New York ones that are out there, and I know some of them don't always get a lot of applications. Um, and I know Pam uh, mentioned that there's, they just updated the scholarship listing on the Tonawanda site as well. So please make sure you check those out and uh, adhere to the deadlines. Typically January to March, April-ish is when the, the, the deadlines for this upcoming year go. Um, but again, pay attention to that. I know students might not want, want to write an essay. When I was a senior in high school, I did not want to write any essays for any scholarships. I didn't, and I didn't get any money from outside sources. But now being on this side of the house and seeing the amount of money some students come in with, whether it's $500, I've seen $6,000 come in, um, it's definitely worth it um, to, to write those essays and take the time to, to submit those applications. Employers, like I said as well, um, I know Wegmans, I always go with Wegmans because we have um, some students who, who get those, um, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Okay, that was a ton of information in you know about 45 minutes or so. Anybody have any questions? I think uh, I did see a chat um, kind of pop up. So let me go see. And no, please go away. All right. So the next one question I have is what did what did you say the Pell income limit was? Also, um, so the Pell income limit, there is no official Pell income limit. It is based upon your EFC from the FAFSA. So and the EFC is based upon the federal formula between um, parent income student income, assets, number in household. So unfortunately, there's not like a cutoff number I can tell you for the Pell, um, but when you do complete your FAFSA form and you get your EFC in that student aid report, um, if your EFC presently is below like 5,200, um, then you would be Pell, El, Pell Grant eligible for some amount of Pell, it, it will range. And the next one, also, what is the thing I hear that if you live in New York State, your child, oh, yep, and that is, uh, so if you live in New York State, your child can go to a state school for free. That is called the Excelsior program that I was talking about. Um, so it is true, um, your um, adjusted gross income has to be, for 2019, has to be $125,000 or less. Um, and again, there's a lot of um, criteria that the student has to, has to meet. Um, while they're in school, they have to be taking at least 15 credit hours per semester. They have to pass all those. Um, they have to, they can't really take any time off. So it's totally doable for some students, but it's not for, for every student. Some students need to only take 12 credits when they first come in because it's just a lot for them going from high school to college. So it's definitely something that you need to discuss and to um, kind of go over. Um, but please, you know, make sure you kind of look into that more. Um, more in depth, but it is called the Excelsior program. It's through New York State. Um, and then I know the state budget right now is kind of up in the air with everything for the following. We don't really know what's going to go on. So I'm not saying that the program might be cut, but I wouldn't be surprised if perhaps some cuts are made um, with um, education funding. So um, just kind of be aware. Uh, the next one is I'm going to be doing ROTC. Um, what all do you get financially? So ROTC is that ROTC for um, if you're going into the, to the military. Um, and it kind of depends on what um, the school is offering. Now, here, like at Niagara, for example, we do have the ROTC program. Some students are selected for scholarships, meaning that they would have your tuition, your fees covered. At Niagara, we would also then cover your room board. Um, but then other students are not on scholarship. They're in the program, but they're not on scholarship. They just have a, a, what we call a normal financial aid package. Um, so it might depend from school to school. Um, if you have been in touch with the schools and they've you know, told you that you're gonna be getting a scholarship, then typically that means that the tuition and fees would be covered. And it's up to the school if they would cover room and board. Um, and do you have need to have a certain grade? I'm assuming you're talking about for, to be an ROTC. Um, Really, for any financial aid, you need to be uh, making satisfactory academic progress, or SAP, as we call it. Typically, that's a 2.0. Um, it's cumulative. So from semester to semester, you know, as long as you have that 2.0, you are in, um, you can continue to have your financial aid. Now, again, each school might have their own different things for maybe their, their merit levels or maybe different academics. You might want to check with those. But for federal aid, it's typically that 2.0 that, that you would need to maintain in order to um, be eligible for federal aid. Okay, any other questions? I am actually going to um, 
pop in the um, copies in the chat for everyone for the links. So there is the link for the um, uh, web worksheet we just went over. And then the other one is the booklet that was uploaded onto your website, your school website. The link to that, so we can take you right there. Um, in the Excelsior program, if a student stops going to college halfway through and does not complete, do they have to pay that back? Um, so they would only have to pay that back if they move out of state, because there's also the, the residency requirements for as many years as you receive the grant, the Excelsior Award, you have to stay in New York State. So let's say you received it for two years, you would have to stay in New York State for two years after that. Um, so in you would, but it would not turn into a loan. It only turns into a loan if they move out of state. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to put my email address um, in the chat as well. Oh, there's another question, but I will put my email address um, just so that everyone has in case you do think of anything else as you go along. Um, there we go. Okay, so another question for work study. How does that figure into the financial aid package if it is awarded? Is the money deposited into their accounts or work the amount off or do they get a paycheck? Um, and if you take it as a check, does the financial award get adjusted? Great questions. Um, so for the work study, what happens, um, it would be part of the financial aid package. It would be, as you would see, as an award um, listed in there. Sometimes it's under a separate section of, of work study. Um, it, we cannot by law automatically just place that on a student's account. They would have to elect to determine that they want to place, you know, a certain percentage. We can do from 10 to 90% onto the student's account from their paycheck. So they'd be working and then, you know, once um, they get paid, you know, up to 90% of that can go onto their account. The 10 the ten percent that's left over, they typically get, you know, it's a couple of dollars. But they would get in a check as well. Um, that, so they would work it off as, as they go along. Um, or they can choose to have a paycheck. Um, and if that's the case, then they would just, you know, like any other job, they would just get that paycheck. They can use it for however they want. Um, and it, if they choose to get as a check, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't affect um, the financial aid package, whether they have it as a direct deposit, like a deferment, or if they get a check. So it would just be awarded to them as a work study job, and they would choose on their end how they would like to have that um, set up. Okay, well, I am going to stop recording um, just so that we can stop that.